Well, I wanted to start off today by asking you a, a, a few, perhaps thought-provoking questions. If you've gone to a doctor, why do they call what doctors do a practice? Does that concern anybody else? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, right? And then how about this one? If that doesn't concern you, this one should. The guy you give your money to, they call him a broker. <laughs> Broke-er, right? That's concerning. And then why do they call the, the, the time where you can travel the slowest rush hour? It doesn't make sense. I come up with these a couple off, line, but the, off online, but my son and I, we've been talking about language. He's seven, almost eight, and, and over the last couple of years, we, we've been talking about the oddities of the English language. Things like, why do they call them apartments when they're all together? Right? Apartment together. Or why is the word abbreviation so long? Right? And, 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 and I've been listening, there's a, there's a comedian, um, his name is Brian Regan, uh, if you've not heard him, he's a, pretty, he, he's, he's a clean comedian, a uh, very, very funny guy, and uh, he has this stand-up portion where he talks about when he was a child learning plurals in English. So, so why is the plural of mouse, mice, but then the plural of house isn't heis, Right? Uh, sometimes our language doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and I'll spare you from many, many other examples that I have. But, but language is an interesting thing, and language is indeed actually a great gift from God, and it's our language that sets us apart as humans from every other creature. But as we know, if we've studied Scripture at all, um, our language, our words are often misunderstood. They're mistranslated, and, and we see that from time to time uh, in other places like uh, international marketing. You might have heard of a couple of these. I'm going to give you a couple more examples. Um, Kentucky Fried Chicken, one of my favorite restaurants, as you can tell. Um, KFC, when they expanded into the Chinese market, they had to translate their slogans and logos and all those kinds of things into Chinese. And one of the things when they were translating at that time, when they were getting their logos and stuff into Chinese, that was back when they used to call it finger licking good. You remember that? Yeah, finger licking good. If you've been around for a while, it's, that used to be their, their slogan. Well, as they translated that into Chinese, it didn't translate quite exactly as you might want it to. And the first time that they ruled it out publicly, the literal translation said, eat your fingers off. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not going to go to that restaurant, right? Another one, that, that's a hilarious one, this cracks me up, even though you've all, I'm sure, heard it before. Chevrolet introduced a, a new car back in the late 60s, early 70s called the Chevy Nova, right? Well, they thought, hey, let's, let's sell this in our Spanish market. So they tried to roll it out in places like Guatemala and Mexico and Honduras and places like that. Well, if you speak Spanish, no means no and va means go. So you're buying the car that won't go. <laughs> right? Nova. Nobody in Central America wanted a Nova. Um, another one, and I'll end with this one. Um, there, there used to be a slogan for uh, the Coors Company that was called Turn It Loose. And you may or may not remember that. Your Baptist few of you will admit it if you remember it. But nonetheless, Coors used to have the slogan called Turn It Loose. And when they translated it to Spanish, it basically said, drink Coors and have diarrhea. <laughs> Which may be appropriate. But not a high point in marketing. And I'm sure Steve probably could tell us some others. He's got a background in marketing. And he, he I'm sure, has encountered some other hilarious ones. But, but the words that we use to communicate can, can be very powerful, right? So we have to be careful how we use them. The words we use can, can make us happy. They can make us sad. They can make us angry. They can, they can fill us with joy. They can make us laugh, as some of you were laughing. Our words can make people cry. They can heal. They can hurt. Words are an important part of our life. Now, any person who communicates with any sort of regularity knows the pitfall of, of saying the wrong thing. And, and I know, you know as, not just as a public speaker, as a pastor, but just as a person, I know that 
uh, many, many times I have said the wrong thing at the wrong time, probably more than my fair share. When people say I have a big mouth, it's because I've put my foot into it so deeply so many times. I've stretched it out a little bit, right? And our words are sometimes unwise. And, and it's unfortunate, though, that that's not a rare event. Even as Christians, our words uh, sometimes come out in ways we don't want them to. And they hurt. They create a mess. And this isn't just a, a modern phenomenon. This has been going on since man t- mankind could speak, I believe. Uh, we read in the book of James chapter 3, it says, We all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is the perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. And we know, of course, as Christians, that there was only one person who, who never stumbled. And that, of course, was Jesus. The rest of us, unfortunately, are, are plagued with the ability to say some really foolish things at times, frankly. And if nobody can avoid saying foolish words, then in one sense, our speech is a, is a lifelong exercise in damage control, isn't it? I mean, have you ever hurt somebody with careless or hasty words? Have you ever perhaps maybe spread a rumor that turned out not to be true? Have you ever said bad things about someone because you were angry at them, right? Or perhaps maybe you've even spoken the right words, but you said them at the wrong time. Yeah? We've all made those kinds of mistakes, haven't we? I know I certainly have. And our goal, of course, is to do so less often. To be able to do less damage control in our lives, right? And so words for all of us are problematic. But, yet yeah, it's still, it is by words that the gospel is preached and proclaimed, right? It is through our words that we can encourage one another. We can build one another up as scripture exhorts us to. Paul even encourages us, encourages us in the the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 4.29, where he says to speak what is good for edification according to the needs of the moment, that it might give grace to those who hear it. Scripture, time and time again, repeatedly tells us to bless and encourage each other with our words. And so that means that our, our speech is actually more than simply just doing damage control, like I was mentioning. Our speech needs to be a a, a lifelong effort to pass along to others grace and love that God has given us. You see, we can be a, a blessing or a curse, either one, with just a few simple words. And so my question for you is, how are you doing on this? One of the primary verses that I examined this past week while studying on this sermon comes from Proverbs 25, 11. And it says, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. See, King Solomon, who wrote these, King Solomon wrote lots and lots of wisdom in these Proverbs. And he injected a bunch of it into this short little phrase about wise speech. See, first it shows that wise words, those wise words that we use are like gold, right? Wise words are inherently and universally universally valuable. They're universally attractive. And the wise words that we use are like apples of gold in that their, their value and their attractiveness has been enhanced by skillful craftsmanship. Another point of wisdom that we can draw from is that these words, as it says, they're in a setting. I just did a, a wedding uh, a little over a week ago and, and was looking at the diamond and the bride's ring and, and the setting, right? Um, when I, when I, my wife and I got married, my wife is, is artistic and, and very creative. And, and I knew that whatever I would give her wouldn't reflect her artistry and, and beauty. And so I simply put it in, in the most basic setting at the diamond that I purchased in the most basic setting and said, let's go and with your input, pick out something that will reflect what you want to wear for the rest of our lives. 
And so that setting is an important thing. And, and it says here in Scripture that it's like gold. It's placed in this silver setting, that a, a craftsmanship. It's like a, a diamond and a wedding ring that has been precisely and importantly placed so that it's perfectly fitted for that circumstance. And then as it says with that silver, that silver in that ring underneath what is often the gold in this setting is, is there to enhance the beauty of the gold and to enhance the beauty of the diamond, displaying it for all to see. And while studying the Proverbs for what sort of wisdom that they might have regarding our speech, I, 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 as I read through the different Proverbs that relate to our speech, I kind of found three different uh, essential components that kept coming up again and again and again. For us to have biblically wise speech, our words must be three things. They must be thoughtful, they must be timely, and they must be truthful. And fortunately for me, they all started with T's. Alliteration is nice when it happens. Let's look at thoughtful first. Proverbs 15, 18 says this, the heart of the righteous weighs its answer, but the mouth of the wicked gushes, I love that word, evil, right? When we speak, we unfortunately don't have the opportunity to hit the rewind button, right? We can't take that back. How many times in my life has my mouth been moving faster than my brain, right? And all of a sudden something comes out and you go, wait a second, that came from me. Uh-oh. Anybody else have that experience? Like you're talking and you realize what you said after you've said it? Problems, right? That never happens in a good way. I've never said something and been like, oh, I'm really glad that came out of me from nowhere. <laughs> right? I wish that happened. I'd be a much better husband if it did. But it doesn't work that way in my life, at least. And so we don't have this luxury to hit the rewind button. And all too frequently, our words spill out of us. And, and the words, frankly, that do spill out of us are often an indicator of our hearts, aren't they? Particularly when we're angry. And therefore, it's incredibly important that we learn from the imagery of this proverb to weigh our words carefully. And by God's grace, usually the, the impulsive speech of Christians isn't necessarily wicked or evil, at least, but it certainly can still be foolish. Now, the Apostle Peter, I love Peter. Peter's one of my favorite characters in all the Bible. Peter was prone to this kind of action, right? One example would be after, after Jesus had described the very necessity of his death in no uncertain terms, right? Jesus says, I am going to die, guys. And it has to be this way. And what does Peter say? Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you, right? Okay, Peter, if you say so. But if you've studied Peter at all, you know. Peter has the foot and mouth disease. He opens his mouth and sticks his foot right in it. And he was prone to speaking out quickly without thinking. And, and, and as a result, we know Peter is a man who said some foolish words. And that can be all of us, can't it, if we're not careful? We all need to learn to be a little slower to speak, as Scripture instructs us, to contemplate for a moment what it is we want to say. We need to examine the implication or the ramifications of the words we are about to use. And this is exactly why if you see you know, big corporations and big businesses and even large nonprofits and even large churches for that matter, they will have a designated spokesperson, right? And that person is the only person who gets to speak for that organization. Because if they walk up just to Joe employee, Joe employee is likely to say something they really don't want said publicly. So everything has to go through that spokesperson because that person has put some thought into the words before they say it. But unfortunately in life, we don't get a designated spokesperson, do we? So we all end up speaking foolishness, occasionally at least, like Peter, don't we? If our words are to be wise... They must be informed not just by facts, but also by the, the knowledge of God. Where do we get that knowledge of God? 
We get that knowledge of God simply by reading his word, by spending time with his people, by spending time in this word here, by picking up our Bibles and being together as believers. That is where that comes. And as we spend time in his word and as we spend time with believers, it will allow us to get better, not perfect, but better at selecting the right words. The second reoccurring theme, as I said, I ran into this week as I was studying our words is that our words, they need to be timely, right? It does, it, it does a man no good to say, hey, buddy, look out for that bus after it's already run him over, right? Timing is everything. If, if you understand comedy, if you study comedy, comedy uh, as, as a pastor, uh, some of the highest forms of speech are comedy because these people get up and, and they speak what would appear at least extemporaneously for hours on end. And, and they're fantastic as they do it. So learning the craft of speaking publicly, um, comedians are ones that pastors often study to pick up hints and ideas. And, and the key to any comedy is timing. If, if the timing is off just a little bit with the punchline, or if you're watching a, a movie, if, if it's physical comedy... If the timing is off by just a little bit, it's just some guy falling downstairs. It's no longer funny, right? It has to be at that precise moment. So the timing of our words is important. Proverbs 15.23 says, A man finds joy in giving an apt reply. And how good is a timely word? Some communication, however true and valid, is given at the wrong moment, right? Right? This is especially true when it comes to words of correction. This is something I, I again and again try to remind myself, I try to learn, I try to be better at. When we praise somebody, we need to praise them publicly, right? It builds that person up. When we are going to critique a person, when we're going to criticize somebody, that needs to be done in private so that it doesn't tear the person down. The very same words in private as opposed to public are the difference between a person receiving it as correction or hearing it as destruction. Does that make sense? And so it's important that we understand we praise publicly, we critique privately. And if you think about it, how many headaches in life would that have saved you had you done that? I know it would have saved me quite a number. See, these little words that we use they shape our lives. If only we will let them. The final point that I want to make today about our words is simply this. Our words need to be truthful. Proverbs twelve nineteen says it most clearly. It says, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only for a moment. When the book of Proverbs was written, there were two types of speech that were strictly forbidden. Words and styles of speech that were forbidden in the nation of Israel. Care to guess what they were? They were giving false testimony and slander and gossip, right? Those were not to be allowed. And this was a time when, when most treaties and, and most legal agreements were done verbally, right? Most people didn't know how to write back in those days. If you were here as we study the book of Ruth, you remember Boaz, right? Boaz goes down to the city gates, this gate where they do all of the meetings, where they transact all of the public business, the land purchases, and all those sorts of things. He gathers up some other witnesses and says, Guys, come sit down here with me. I need you to, I need you to record this transaction in your minds. I need you to be my witnesses. I need you to hear my words. And as he did that, he claimed Ruth to be his wife. And the witnesses there weren't going to lie about it because it would undermine the entirety of the fabric of their society. Now, much is still the same today. Lying is always a losing bet, right? Proverbs states that quite wisely. A lie cannot endure. Have you ever been caught up in a lie? Anybody ever not been caught up in a lie? Right? And then you tell that first lie. Now to keep that lie going, now you've got to say a second lie, right? Because you're trying to cover the first lie. And then 
Now there's another lie about the f- lie about the lie. And pretty soon, you're just, you're, 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 you've got so many things going, you can't even remember. This is how everybody gets caught lying. You've told so many lies, you can't remember the first lie. And you tell somebody else or something, and all of a sudden you're caught because what you said contradicted what you originally said. Right? Now, some people get pretty good at this, at this, but particularly in kids, like two or three levels of lie, and they're done. You, you can catch them, right? It's like, where were you? Jimmy's house? Well, why do you have pizza all over your face? Because his mom fed us pizza? Why do you have a pizza hut hat on your head? Um, about that time, kids run out of the ability to cover, right? We need to speak the truth. Lying is always a losing bet. And as we speak the truth, we begin to build credibility. You see, trust, trust is earned. And it only takes a moment to destroy trust. A simple few small words can ruin years of effort to build trust. It takes a long time to build trust, but you can lose it in an instant by telling a lie. And the second forbidden speech that they spoke about then was the slander and gossip, right? Scripture is pretty clear about slander. By definition, slander is false information about somebody else. Well, gossip may or may not still be true. Gossip, though, fails on the timeliness issue, and it fails the thoughtfulness test as well. And more often than not, gossip, probably more than 50% of the time, isn't true. And the worst part about gossip is we often engage in gossip ourselves simply because we like to, don't we? We like to be the person in the know. We like to have other people think that we are well-connected, that we are knowledgeable. And we like having people come to us for information. Pride, right? But how many friendships have been ruined by gossip? How many fights has gossip caused? How much animosity, how much discomfort? More than we could ever count, right? Can you think of a single time in your life where something good came of gossip? I don't think I can. Have you ever personally benefited from gossip? I doubt it. See, gossip, it it feeds our pride. And it gives us a sense of power. It gives us a sense of superiority. But it's always done at somebody else's expense. And the Proverbs are clear. We need to avoid gossip and avoid those who participate in it. Well, so then why does God care so much about the words that we use? Well, it's because the words that we use are simply a gift from him. Words are presented at the very beginning of time from God to us in Genesis 1.1. God spoke the universe into being, right? There was nothing. And God went and spoke and created all that is. It is through his words that he creates. God didn't go down to the cosmic Walmart and pick up some dirt and dust and water and sticks and then got out his glue and put it all together. No. God breathed through his words us into existence. And then God has told mankind about himself, about his word through his Bible. And then God sent his, his, his son, who he called the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1, 1, 1, correct? So words are important to God. And if they're so important to him, uh, then frankly, they need to be important to us as well. To accurately reveal God's image in us, We must use words according to his command and according to his purposes. So my challenge to you this week is simply this. 
commit yourself to honing and honor, honing your words and honoring God with your words. Commit yourself to being careful with what you say. Watch your words and use them well. And as you do it, God will increasingly give you grace and wisdom to continue to use your words to be a blessing and encouragement to those around you. Use your words well to the glory, honor, and praise of your Heavenly Father. Amen. Let's pray.